So in the next two texts we're going to be looking at, uh, Robert W. Chambers, The King in Yellow, and Arthur Mockin's The Great God Pan, um, we're going to be looking at where the weird is genuinely born. Right? We talked a little bit last time about that convergence between the Gothic and the decadent. And this is where we really kind of see those two streams mix. So Chambers, The King in Yellow, um, becomes, it's a short story collection, right? it becomes a big influence on Lovecraft and certain other later writers. So let's look a little bit um, at Chambers with the history of this particular book first. Hello, move, thank you. So this is the title page for the first edition. We see uh, this, I imagine, is supposed to be the king in yellow with great big giant black wings. Creepy enough. This is Cham Robert Chambers' second published book, and it first appears in 1895. His first book was called In the Quarter, meaning the Latin Quarter of Paris, and it's a sketch, or um, a series of sketches, really, of the lives of decadent artists living in Paris. So one thing that he carries over from this early book that's simply a realistic look at artists is this focus on the artist as a central character, the life of the artist as central to the, uh, to the story. The King in Yellow is a really, really odd book. It mixes elements of realism, science fiction, and supernatural horror. And this is really kind of what the weird is. It's a blend of these three elements with a couple of little extra things added. For example, the kind of inability to express in words what is happening or what you're experiencing. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting about The King in Yellow is that it's deeply critical of certain late 19th century American ideas of progress. Now, these were largely borrowed from ideas that grew out of 19th century British utilitarianism, which we talked about last time. Um, various historians, mostly associated with the Whig or Liberal Party uh, in Britain, came up with a theory of history that suggested that things only got better as time progressed and that these improvements were made primarily by great men, right? Men who changed the way we looked at the world, who changed the way we voted or the way we thought or the way we ate or, you know, what have you, right? So single powerful individuals changing the course of history, always for the better, right? Things always improve. And American literature, American thought in the 19th and early 20th centuries are deeply wedded to this idea of progress and that everybody's going to be upwardly mobile, right? Everything's going to get better. Things only improve from here. The first four tales in the, in the collection are intertwined with each other and are concerned with a mysterious forbidden book called The King in Yellow. So what do we know about this forbidden book, right? What information does Chambers give us about it? First, we know that it's a play in two acts. It has at least three characters, Casilda, Camilla, and the stranger. And the stranger seems to be the king in yellow in some kind of disguise. The stranger wears a pallid mask that, it turns out, is not a mask. And that it takes place in a city called Carcosa, which is located in some fantastic landscape, right? It appears to be on another planet, or in the distant past, or the distant future, or what have you, right? It's not on an Earth that we recognize. We also know that the play itself is apparently dangerous. It drives those who read it mad. 
So here we have an artist's rendition of what Carcosa with a sky full of black stars might look like. Now, we have here from the repairer of reputations a lengthy quote in which the narrator, Hildred Castain, describes his first experience with this forbidden book. During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I remember after finishing the first act that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred grate and fell open on the hearth in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was a joy, so poignant that I suffered in every nerve. I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and reread it, and wept and laughed and trembled with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, when the twin suns sink into the lake of Holly. And my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. I pray God will curse the writer, as the writer has cursed the world with this beautiful, stupendous creation, terrible in its simplicity, irresistible in its truth, a world which now trembles before the king in yellow, when the French government seized the translated copies, which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread like an infectious disease from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit, censured even by the most advanced of literary anarchists. No definite principles have been violated in those wicked pages, no doctrine promulgated, no convictions outraged. It could not be judged by any known standard, yet, although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the King in Yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain, nor thrive on words in which the essence of the purest poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow, the, the blow to fall afterward with more awful effect. So I know that this is a great big giant chunk of text here, but it's kind of important that we consider this whole thing. Right? In part, this tells us about the social world in which the book operates, right? in which it's located. This is a book that is considered dangerous by the governments of its time. And yet, there's nothing explicitly political or didactic or moral about it, right? This is a work of supreme decadence, right? The supreme note of art has been struck. But there's no specific principle, moral or political or otherwise, advanced. Now, the other thing to note about the book is the way, one, the way it's titled, right? The King in Yellow. Yellow is the color of decay, of infection, of disease. And the book seems to spread throughout the Western Hemisphere like a kind of disease, right? It's, um, you know, it spreads, <laughs> in fact, Chambers says it spreads like an infectious disease. Right, it's contagious. It's banned in Paris, so everybody in London, like, it's quarantined in Paris, right? So everyone in London wants to read it. Everyone in London wants to catch it. And this is from The Repairer of Reputations. Now, <laughs> Chambers is not entirely original in his conception here, right? And this is going to point us to another thing about the weird generally. A lot of authors in the weird subgenre borrow from each other, and some of them even write in a kind of shared universe. 
Uh, for example, when we look at Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard um, a little bit later in the course, Lovecraft is writing in his own present, and Howard is writing stories that are assumed to take place in the same world in a much, much earlier period. Now, Chambers isn't necessarily writing in a shared universe with other writers, but he is borrowing from other, you know, quote-unquote weird source material. In particular, he's borrowing a lot from the American author and journalist Ambrose Bierce, um, also known as Bitter Bierce. If you've ever encountered Bierce, then you have either uh, read probably his satirical um, <clears throat> dictionary called The Devil's Dictionary, or maybe in high school or in Comp 2 or in American Lit, uh, you read his short story, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Chambers borrows a couple of names here from Bierce's work. He borrows the name Haster from Bierce's short story, Haida the Shepherd, which is a fantasy, um, of course. And Haster in that story is a simple shepherd god. Um, but in this story, or this set of stories, Haster seems to be a place. Carcosa is also borrowed um, from a kind of post-apocalyptic story by Bierce. He's also borrowing a lot from astronomy, right? We know something about the location of Carcosa, right? It's out in the High Aids, which is a star cluster in the constellation of Taurus, near Alde, like you can see, Aldebaran, um, a red giant, so one of the largest stars in the constellation Taurus, sort of from Carcosa, apparently according to the play. And the idea of the mask is, I think, one of the things that's borrowed most directly from Deccans, right? Oscar Wilde promulgated a kind of doctrine of the mask, right? That people spoke more honestly when they were hidden behind a persona. And indeed, an artist was much more interesting if he could adopt a series of masks, a series of personae. That was all part and parcel of being the artist. So you didn't want to show people yourself, your inner private self. What you wanted to show them was the variety of different masks that you could wear. Now, the king in yellow himself wears, we see, no mask. Right? His true form is what he shows to Casilda and Carmilla, Camilla, and it terrifies them, right? So what the characters who encounter this play are seeing is kind of like the reality of their surroundings, and it drives them mad. Now, it's probably a little bit strange to think of this particular work as a satire, considering that so much of it is focused on horror. But it is actually a satirical representation of certain tendencies of 1890s utopian progressive thought. Right? Remember that idea that everything gets better, the technological progress in particular, makes everything better. So let's think about what the world looks like in the 1920s, according to Chambers writing in 1895. Right. This, by the way, is uh, the white city of the Chicago World's Fair in the early 1890s. So we have stories that take place in New York and in Paris in 1920, so 25 years into the future, or into Chambers' future. And weirdly prescient here, right, probably purely coincidence, these stories take place shortly after a war between the U.S. and Germany. The U.S. has become a true empire. Right. It runs like an empire now. There's been a huge military buildup, of which Hildred Castaigne's cousin is a part, Cities have been raised and reorganized along purely rational plans. And, for
foreign-born Jews, African Americans, and American Indians, right? Basically, anyone who is not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant has been expelled from the country. And there are lethal chambers that have been set up everywhere for legal assisted suicide. So what we have here is an authoritarian dystopia. And Hildred Castain, the narrator of The Repairer of Reputations, wants to supplant the current empire and set up himself as emperor of the United States and found a dynasty, right? By getting his cousin, whom he has somehow come to the conclusion is the true heir, the true heir, the true emperor, out of the way. So <clears throat> it might also behoove us to spend a little bit of time talking about the decadent artist figures that we encounter in this narrative. This is another drawing by Aubrey Beardsley, the decadent illustrator par excellence. First and foremost, we have the nameless author of the play, right? His work of supreme aestheticism drives the action of every story and is what's driving all of these other artist figures around the world completely insane. It's what's, it's what's driving them mad. We have the figures of Boris Yvain and Jack Scott in The Mask, both of whom are curiously indifferent to life in the pursuit of art, in their experiments with this substance that seems to turn everything into um, a kind of stiff marble. We have the nameless artist in the yellow sign, who after his encounter with the pallid, fat young gentleman um, outside of the studio, finds the colors of decay and disease simply creeping into his art, right? He can no longer paint a proper nude portrait anymore because the colors start to look diseased. And because he then begins a sexual relationship with his model, he can no longer keep his life and his art separate. So all of that starts to break down and degenerate. And most of these stories do involve the breakdown of a mind in some way, shape, or form. Right? Most clearly and obviously in the repair of reputations. One of the interesting questions that this particular story leaves open is what exactly caused Hildred Castain to lose his mind? Did he lose his mind from uh, reading The King in Yellow, or had he already lost it due to a physical, material, biological cause? Right? The fall from my horse had fortunately left no evil results. On the contrary, it changed my whole character for the better. From a lazy young man about town, I had become active, energetic, temperate, and above all, oh, above all else, ambitious. There was only one thing which troubled me. I laughed at my own uneasiness, and yet it troubled me. So he reads The King in Yellow while he's convalescing from this fall. So is it the play that causes his mania? Or is it just something that he then latches on to in his mania, having already gone mad, that then sort of further feeds it? His associate, Mr. Wilde, the repairer of reputations of the title. Right, the most remarkable thing about Mr. Wilde was that a man of his marvelous intelligence and knowledge should have such a head. It was flat and pointed, like the heads of many of those unfortunates whom people in prison, in prison and asylums for the weak-minded. Many called him insane, but I knew him to be as sane as I was. And of course, we know that Hildred Castain is completely batshit crazy, right? So if Mr. Wilde is as sane as Castain is, then he is also completely batshit crazy. Now to move to the mask, 
the narrator in that particular story has also read The King in Yellow. And it's had an impression upon him as well. It causes um, a sort of nervous disease in him. I thought, too, of The King in Yellow, wrapped in the fantastic colors of this tattered mantle, and that bitter cry of Casilda, not upon us, O King, not upon us. Feverishly I struggled to put it from me, but I saw the Lake of Holly, thin and blank, without a ripple or wind to stir it, and I saw the towers of Carcosa behind the moon. Aldebaran, the Hyades, Alar, Haster, glided through the cloud rifts, fluttered and flapped, as they passed like the scallop tatters of the King in Yellow. Among, among all these, one sane thought persisted. It never wavered, no matter what else was going on in my disordered mind, that my chief reason for existing was to meet some requirement of Boris and Genevieve. So, when this play is read by a figure who already seems to be at least a little bit disturbed, what it seems to do is give them this kind of bizarre sense of purpose, right? That there's something that they're supposed to do. For Hildred Castain, it's become Emperor of the United States. For the narrator in the mask, it meets some requirement of Boris and Genevieve, whatever that may be. We also see someone seeking solace in a church and in the court of the dragon after having read The King in Yellow. I was worn out by three nights of physical suffering and mental trouble. The last had been the worst, and it was an exhausted body and a mind benumbed and yet acutely sensitive, which I had brought to my favorite church for healing, for I had been reading The King in Yellow. Now here, for the first time, we actually see the book as a source of mental and physical degeneration or disease. Right. He's come to a church for spiritual regeneration after having read this damaging play, but the mania that the play has instilled in him takes root while he sits through the service, and he has this bizarre sort of fantasy fugue sequence regarding the organist. Now, finally, where we see the uncanny here evolving fully into the weird. Right, these encounters with the terrifying and inexpressible. First, in the court of the dragon. Right. But I had escaped him. There was eyes that said I should not. Had I escaped him? That which gave him the power over me came back out of oblivion where I had hoped to keep it, for I knew him now. Death and the awful abode of lost souls, whither my weakness long ago had sent him. They had changed him for every other eye, but not for, excuse me, not for mine. I had recognized him almost from the first. I had never doubted what he was come to do. And now I knew while my body sat safe in the cheerful little church, he had been hunting my soul in the court of the dragon. Now he, of course, is the notorious king in yellow. But what's happening here to the narrator, right, is he's recognizing that he's had this weird out-of-body experience where the sinister church organist has chased him through the city of Paris into the little court of apartments where he lives, right? So it's chased him from church to home and really kind of taken over his mind and soul. Now, to give you a second example from the yellow sign. The artist, narrator, and his model, Tessie, have read The King in Yellow together. Then as we answered each other, swiftly, silently, thought on thought, the shadows stirred in the gloom about us, and far in the distant streets we heard a sound. Nearer and nearer it came, the dull crunching of wheels, nearer and yet nearer, and now, outside before the door had ceased, and I dragged myself to the window and saw a black-plumed hearse, the same hearse he's been seeing in his dreams throughout the, uh, throughout the story. The gate below opened and shut, and I crept, shaking to my door, and bolted it. But I knew no bolts, no locks, 
could keep that creature out who was coming for the yellow sign. And now I heard him moving very softly along the hall. Now he was at the door, and the bolts rotted his touch. Now he had entered. With eyes starting from my head, I peered into the darkness. But when he came into the room, I did not see him. It was only when I felt him envelop me in his cold, soft grasp that I cried out and struggled with deadly fury. But my hands were useless, and he tore the onyx clasp from my coat and struck me full in the face. Then as I fell, I heard Tessie's soft cry, and her spirit fled. And even while falling, I longed to follow her, for I knew that the king in yellow had opened his tattered mantle, and there was only God to cry to now. So, we see here the capture of, I'm almost finished. We see here the capture of the artist's mind and soul by this figure out of what they have, what he and others have called the supreme work of art. Right? Somehow, the central figure in this aestheticist work has come into the real world, and essentially taking over the minds and souls of artists. So I'll leave it to you to figure out exactly what to do with that. But we'll be dealing with some similar issues when we look at the great god Pan. It's coming from a similar place. So when you read the great god Pan, I want you to think about first what the purpose is of Dr. Raymond's experiment on a servant girl, Mary. What theory is he testing on her? Who or what does Helen Vaughn's strange playmate represent? And what does this tell us about her origins? Right? Where does she come from? Compare the effect of knowing Helen Vaughn to the effect the King in Yellow had on its readers. How much do we actually know about Helen and her activities and so what? Do we ever really see her doing much directly? And finally, what do you make of the description of Helen's death? What does it tell us about her true nature and about late Victorian scientific and cultural anxieties? All right, so more decadence and gothic coming together next time. See you then.